Well, my guest today, Sukyun Lee, is of course known for her role hosting DNTO, the weekly storytelling show on CBC Radio 1 that examines the small, surprising, and often funny tales that come through the various facets of our day-to-day lives. But while you might say her day job is in radio, she's certainly not one to be limited or confined to one medium. In fact, it's hard to name a medium that Sukyun Lee hasn't expressed herself through. She's used her storytelling abilities as an actor, film director, musician, writer, uh, and of course, for many years, she was an on-air VJ for much music. Sukyun Lee grew up on the West Coast in Vancouver in a situation that could only be called chaotic. Her parents divorced in her early teens, and after living with her dad for a while, she ended up living with a group of supportive artists at a place called The Ranch. It was in this context that Sukyun Lee first really started to get drawn to storytelling and art, and they served, or seemed to serve at least, not just uh, something for stimulation, but even something that was virtually necessary to make sense of her chaotic conditions. I sat down with Sukyun Lee in the summer of 2012 uh, for my regular show, The Public, on CIUT, to speak about her life in the arts, her upbringing, and what storytelling means to her. When we recorded this interview, Sukyun Lee had just returned from a month of shooting uh, in Winnipeg for the CBC biopic, uh, the Jack Lane story, in which she played Olivia Chow, which is how I started the interview. So, King Lee, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Kevin. You, you just came back from, from Winnipeg shooting the Jack Lane movie. What was that experience like? Uh, gosh, that's a really big question. It was um, very intense and all-encompassing. It was very challenging. Um, yeah, it was, it was actually crazy, mind-boggling. Um, in a great way and in a in a uh, very surreal way. <laughs> so, so it was a big challenge then for you to to take on the role. Yeah, it was a huge challenge. Um, but I uh, like I, I I'm a storyteller first and foremost. I like everything that I do, if it's music or film or acting or what have you, sort of based in story. So, as a storyteller, I really felt the need to commit to this part and do it with all my might. Um, and I think, um, well, I did, I did that. I tried to understand her where she was coming from and then kind of marry that with me. So it's not, it's not a mimicry of her. I'm not trying to mimic her or anything like that, but I try to find the, the commonalities between us and also bring, you know, myself to the experience because everybody knows what it is like to encounter death, encounter the death of a loved one. Not everybody. It's actually a surprising, not it. Many people haven't, but it is inevitable, and I I do have that experience. So, just sort of rooting around, and I think what is on screen will be a sort of a strange amalgam of fact and fiction. Speaking about our own mortality, your the art exhibit that you have at TIFF coming up, um, that also comes from a place of of looking at our own mortality and trying to deal with, uh, I guess, our vulnerability. Um, can, can can you talk about the genesis for? For this project, sure. Um, we are light rays. Is is this sort of um, photography and video exhibition that I'm doing as part of TIFF's Future Projection series? But yeah, no, um, that uh, is sort of um, this group of photographs came out of um, my sister. My little sister Deanna was diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, um, in 2011, and um, I relocated back to my hometown of Vancouver to be part of her support group. And it was a very aggressive form of cancer. She's a young woman, and, and we're seeing spikes in breast cancer in young women and postmenopausal women. So there's some strange things occurring there. But specifically with young women, it's extremely aggressive because they're robust and young and healthy, and so is the cancer. And so she just found this mass when she went to hug a friend, and pretty soon it was just like, uh, as it became clear that it was a, that it was cancer, it, it was it really threw us all for a loop. So my family, um, my family, is it's kind of a mess. My my parents um, divorced in a very terrible manner when we were very young, and so my sisters and I, their four four daughters, sort of went scattershot when the family imploded. So there have been a lot of difficulties within the family just getting together. But in this moment of crisis, and my sisters. Um, cancer diagnosis, uh, we, we all came together and went back to Vancouver. 
And it was discombobulating and painful process for her. You know, she went through the whole ringer, be it um, radiation, chemotherapy, and finally surgery to remove her breast. And um, and then resurgery because the 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 sur- surgical procedure failed the first time, so she had to do that twice. And you know, really uh, intense experience of um, of having to deal with pain, having to move to new thresholds, having to come together. And there was just a day where she was like, they she they had to give her some steroids to deal with certain things. Your, your body is just like rife full of all kinds of crazy chemical cocktails that are both burning your body and, and killing off that, which is harming you, but also hopefully not kill you. And so my sister and I were walking around and um, she was in a great deal of pain. And we sat in a park and we sat under a tree and um, I had a bunch of art supplies and we just started painting and drawing. And my sister's a beautiful visual artist And we realized we could experience some kind of escape, small moments of escape from from the disease by making art. And that just became, we became an art making factory. And so every day, you know, um, we would uh, create a piece of art, sometimes in response to a question that we would respond with making something and we'd share it at the end of the day. Like a question like what you would, you you would pose each other a question? Yeah. Yeah. There were, we had a bunch of questions just like, um, you know, I don't. I can't even remember them, but there was just like very open into it to interpret, like open to interpretation. And then we just make stuff, you know, like um, your favorite food or, you know, I don't know, uh, your best friend or, you know, something like that or, or the high point of your day or, you know, different, different things like that. And then you're each each interpret. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very widely. And we spent a lot of time making art. And during this process, um, I had been working on a movie, a feature movie, and I had to put it on hold. I was developing it, but, you know, going back to Vancouver and um, being with my sister, just I can, couldn't make the movie right, right, right down. But I really enjoy telling stories in images. And so I had been taking a lot of photographs. And I realized one afternoon as I was looking at all the photographs that if I took two disconnected photos, two photos that were not even taken in the same place or what have you, just divergent, diverse photos. Certain particular combinations of these photos evoke for me a movie. They were, it was using the similar part of my imagination and sort of organizational part of my brain um, to slam two images together and suddenly it was like, oh my God, this is a movie. It's like a storyboard. Well, not even a storyboard, it's a movie. It's like... I can't really describe it. It's really like you'd have to look at it, see it yourself and make up your own movie. But to me, there, there, it wasn't just like a storyboard, like this scene, this scene. To me, they encapsulated a film, each of these sort of diptychs. And to me, that was very exciting because when you make a movie, you have to have lots of money and you have to work with a lot of people. And there's a real delegation of chores and duties. Whereas this, I could make several movies in a four clicks of my camera. Um, but it was really, really exciting. And after my sister was out of the woods and I moved back to Toronto a year later, we submitted, uh, we met with the people from TIFF and they liked it too. And so they invited me to be part of this, this, um, future predictions show. So that's what it is really is less inspired by death. Although death and mortality are a part of it. It's more about sickness and how sickness and disease move us in unusual ways. I mean, that's the kind of thing. And and also, I I do think that there's a kind of um, just sort of search for connection. There's a sort of through line for for through through the pieces that there is a kind of elusive search for communion and connection. You mentioned in in your artist brief that you had a very difficult childhood. Um, you, and you're, like you said, just uh, a few minutes ago, your parents did divorce and it sort of uh, shattered the family in a sense. Is this a common theme? Like, is that what you have been doing with art is, is looking for a way to connect or to sort of have a cathartic release from the tougher parts of life? Well, I know that, um, I feel like, uh, my relationship with my mom is, very challenging and difficult, but I also know that much of what I have experienced in that relationship is 
fueled my desire to express myself and communicate. It's less about kind of like in search for connection. I, I think it's like, I guess it's just like, I think I'm always oftentimes searching for connection, but it's really out of, you know, like my mom is my greatest love and my greatest perpetrator. So that's a complicated relationship to try to understand why the person you love has kind of really hurt you in trying to love that person. So it's a, it's, 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 um, a complicated thing. My, my mother, um, is, uh, she is very troubled. Um, and, uh, there's no one in the family that speaks with her anymore except for me because they're worried because she could be extremely disruptive and she's a bit like Callie, the goddess of destruction. She has, uh, destroyed a lot of, a lot of, um, people were set, set out to destroy them. Um, but I understand kind of what fuels that rage. I have, I've had to understand that. So, you know, my earliest recollection of my mom was she was a really amazing person, but things turned and, you know, she suffers from borderline paranoid schizophrenia. And I had to under, understand why she was behaving like this. Why is she, why is she beating the shit out of me? So, <laughs> that, that would really happen when you were young. It was, it was that bad. Yeah. Yeah. How early did that start? How young were you? Um, I don't know, like, uh, six, seven around there. So your earliest memories are, are, are good and, and of your mom, but after that things started to sort of fall apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to understand that. So I, a lot of my life has been detective work and talking to other family members and trying to uncover my mom's story. And when I did, I can't fault her, you know, like I can't fault her. Like she still slips up and she still tries to hurt me sometimes. And I try to be honest with her and say, Hey, you know what? That doesn't feel too good. And I got to check out for a while. So I try to be, I don't feel like she's going to hurt me anymore in terms of destroy me. My sisters are not as safe. They don't feel as safe. And I respect their, I understand that they need to keep keep away. How, how did you deal with that that volatility in your life when you were young? Uh, you and your sisters was it? Uh, did you bandy together, or did you each deal with it in your own way? Um, we each dealt with it in our, our own way, and I banded with my older sister. But then there t t t there was a time where she had to flee, so she left and she couldn't say where she was going. So yeah. You were 15 when your parents divorced, though? Mm -hmm. So your family was able to stay together that long despite yeah. all the difficulties? Yeah. That's, that seems quite amazing. It is amazing. Well, in Chinese families, even now, it's like very taboo to divorce. So, yeah, I know it's uh, keep keep it together, keep it together. And then just there, it came came to a point where it couldn't be kept together anymore. And did your dad leave or, or what, what actually happened when, when the breaking point occurred? Um, my dad came downstairs, I was ironing the clothes and he said, she's asked me to go. And this is just like the apex of a very several, many months of deterioration and yelling and just violence. And so I said, can I come too? And he said, okay, let's go. And I just grabbed my stuff and I lived with him for a while. And then I moved out from him, from living with him. So, Yeah. And so not long after, my third sister left, so we were both, I was very lucky to like have kind of like peer group of artists that were sort of my extended family, and I was signed over to as a ward of the court. Um, so I, my, you know, my dad had lost his job, he didn't have very much money, and he was also not well, and kind of re trying, to, trying to get back after everything happened. And so he was busy. My mom was embattled. And so, uh, but I found a very wonderful group of friends, you know, who were artists and poets and musicians who embraced me and became like uh, my mentors. And uh, my sister, um, Dee Dee, was also in the middle. So the, th the two of us being in the middle kind of got, you know, jettisoned out into the world. And sh she was not as lucky. She ended up in foster care and running with a number of street gangs and stuff like that. And she passed away. 
it really was like a sort of a bomb went off in the middle of your family and everyone had to sort of pick up by themselves, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. What was going on, like, before this, you were going to high school and everything, and, and like, how were you dealing with this? Um, were, were you able to have some sort of normal life at all? I, I bet I guess you wouldn't even know what a normal life is. Yeah, I don't know what a normal life is. And when I see people living, living normal lives, it's a bit perplexing. When I see, like, families and moms and daughters, especially getting along, it's like, oh, that's so sweet. But it's so odd. <laughs> so oftentimes I kind of am attracted to sort of more, you know, uh, less uh, traditional situations. Um, you know, like I remember being at a party and it was a Christmas party and everybody's in like, like a nice wool sweater and singing, you know, Celtic songs and stuff. And I, me and my Iraqi Jewish friend were just like, what? I don't get it. I just don't get this. So, yeah. So sometimes it can be intimidating and feeling odd when, when I see super functional situations, <laughs> I feel maybe a little bit more in common with kind of little off the beaten track relationships. Um, but yeah, no, I don't know anything different. Um, yeah. So, and I also think that in retrospect, these life events are my greatest teachers. My mom is one of my greatest teachers. It kind of annoys me because she's really, really arrogant. She's like, any talent you have comes from me. She wants to own everything I do. But in some weird way, she's right through the difficult course of life and trying to understand it. I feel like I, you know, she has been one of my teachers. You are also uh, of Chinese parents and living in a predominantly white uh, suburb of Vancouver. Was that difficult too? I mean, did you feel like you belonged outside of, of your dysfunctional family? I mean, did you have any place to, to belong before you ran away? Hmm. Yeah, there's small moments of belonging. I belonged in my older sister's bed. I, I, I always loved following her and to her annoyance. I was sort of like the annoying little sister who always wanted to hang out. Um, and, um, but it was odd. Um, I am very Chinese, you know. Like I was always aware that I was Chinese within a, in within the white 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 suburb. It was like very 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 obvious. It was like me and Bev Wong, you know. And 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 there comes with that. There's just like basic things of like people sort of very you know like being treated like you look weird, and and you kind of do because like you don't look like everyone else. And, you know, no one would ever dream of like um, asking me to go out like in grade four and grade three and stuff when all the girls were being asked to go out for a day and stuff. I mean, the closest that I had was like somebody said, oh, Mike Suter wants to go out with you. But then as soon as class was out, he was like, oh, he changed his mind because <laughs> he's like, you're a freak. And so that was pretty obvious to me. But then also just like my, like I wasn't, I was very, it was a very strict family. So I had to go home right after school and there was a lot of TV watching and there was a lot of hanging out with my sister. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, I knew it was weird. Like I knew there was something wrong in my family with the violence and it, it really, really was like living in a war zone. And, um, you know, I could see other people and their lives didn't resemble mine. And I kind of knew there was something else. And then um, it was, um, I, I ended up having to change a few schools because of disruptions, like things with in my family would cause me to do something embarrassing at, at school, like break down and not be able to go back to school because I was embarrassed and stuff. So I changed schools a couple of times. And like you break down actually in, in class? Yeah. Yeah, it would be precipitated by a very volatile argument with my mom and I couldn't contain myself anymore. And then I just sort of have a meltdown at school. And then when you're in grade eight or nine, it's terribly embarrassing. So I would just change change schools and stuff. So, um, yeah, what was I gonna, What was the question again? Uh, whether you had any sort of constancy or, or place you could... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a time when this strange punk guy, the only punk in my neighborhood showed up and I became friends with him. He was my first boyfriend. And he introduced me to like post-punk bands and existential authors like, um, you know, James Joyce and Franz Kafka and Samuel Beckett and amazing, like mind expanding 
art, literature, and music. And then I was like, oh my God, I am so getting out of here. <laughs> so when my parents did, you know, when my family imploded, I was like ready to go. You have said that you were confident and outgoing before the divorce, and then you became quite shy afterwards. No, I was confident and outgoing as a little one. You know, I, I was pretty brazen. I don't think I had any kind of self-consciousness. And then I started like around nine when you start becoming aware of yourself. I think it coincided with, um, I don't know. I, I remember watching my first Woody Allen film and then becoming aware of this word called neuros, this word called neurotic and like this thinking process. I was like, Oh, like what's, what's, being a neurotic oh it's thinking about my life it's thinking and then suddenly this whole floodgate it's sort of there was a year where I was watching I was a tv addict so I watched a lot of tv and a lot of children's shows but then back then they'd show other weird stuff so I remember like flipping between channels and it was like cartoons cartoons the after school specials and then it was Roman Polanski's Repulsion which is like Catherine Deneuve is a young beautiful woman who who experiences psychoses and goes crazy and I was freaked out and I immediately changed the channel, but I found myself wanting to go back there to understand and solve the puzzle of this woman. I remember being like seven or eight and actually deeply understanding her dilemma and feeling compassion for her. And it was around that time too that I saw stumbled upon Woody Allen's work too. And so, you know, I think as I coasted into, you know, being a, a tween, I became really, really shy. Shy, 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 shy. Really, I don't know what happened, but super shy. And everything that I came out of my mouth was stupid. And so I just shut up and I swam. I was a swimmer. I was a competitive swimmer. And again, it was one of those things where I had excelled in the pool and I had like the number one and two time for 13, 14 year old girls in Canada for a 100 and 200 meter breaststroke. And they put me up to the older kids one. So I was always out of step somehow, not ever quite being in league with a gang. Um, so yeah, um, I got really shy during that time. And then by the time I was 15, I was super shy and feeling ugly. And uh, I just, thank God, had some art. I could express myself through writing and making plays and videos. And you were already experimenting with all these forms that that young. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I found it fun. Like I ended up changing another school, yet another school, and that's when I could actually start taking the courses that I really wanted to take, like art. Before that, it was forbidden for me to take art or anything like that. It was all like you got to take maths and sciences. But when I went to this new school, I was like, I'm taking a drama class. And for a shy kid to suddenly be in front of the class having to do a scene from a play or even there was one thing it was like, okay, come up with a commercial. And somehow like I came up with this commercial, but I <laughs> I would love to see it again, but I came up with this commercial and, but the whole subplot was this, this sort of devastating teen reality that I interwove into this soap commercial. And I really remember like it being a very cathartic and kind of meaningful experience and being driven to tears in this expression and feeling like, wow, I really, you know, that was nice to be able to express myself in this commercial. <laughs> so, yeah, so I was able to take stuff like that. And, and I, I started entering contests that were outside of school, like, you know, film and video contests and a playwright search. And, you know, I was inspired by Samuel Beckett. So I did my own absurdist play called Achieving Cosmic Awareness Through the Examination of an Eggplant um, <laughs> and made videos of like kickboxers beating the shit out of each other, juxtaposed with children on a playground. And I started to win a bunch of awards and stuff like that, which made me feel pretty darn good about expressing myself in this manner. And also the person that exposed me to existential authors and art. He gave me a journal and man, that journal, there were several journals, just chock a block full of stuff. I was just reading the journals the other day and it's like, oh my God, this is a very visceral and raw reality. I was laughing. I was reading them with my boyfriend and I was kind of embarrassed, like, oh my God. And he's like, no, this is real and this is electric. And so I, you know, that was sort of sequestered in, into my journals and in my art. It sounds, it sounds like as soon as you 
found that the ability to express yourself through art, it was like a, a waterfall of, of expression that, that sort of built up because you had no other place to churn, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I was in a new school. I met these awesome artists and people in Vancouver, and I found myself much more interested in the world of their their world. And I found there was one particular house we called The Ranch, and people just hung out there and shared read poetry and like spontaneous improvisations would come up. And I feel very blessed to have had those people as my mentors because rarely would anybody grab a guitar and play a finite song. It was more like, let it, let's improvise. Let's communicate with one another through sound. It was very experimental. And so as somebody who, you know, I, I found it a very freeing experience and it encouraged me to do be free in art and so I'm, I'm very lucky to have those those people as my early early um, kind of artistic um, collaborators and inspirations. And I became much 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 less interested in school, and so I quit. I haven't graduated from high school. So you left home before you quit high school. Yes. And left your dad too. And yeah, yeah. And then I quit high school. How did how did you actually find the, such a supportive group? And and what did that look like? I mean, how do you? I, I don't think most of us, myself included, could imagine leaving home uh, and being on one's own at at the age of fifteen. What did that? What was that like at the time? Well, it's really it was exciting. Um, I sort of met this group of people because I was doing tons of painting, and I enjoyed painting, and I wanted I I knew that there was a gallery that you know would put on shows and stuff. And um, I went to the gallery and spoke with a curator, showed her work, my work, and she loved it. And she put on my show. And she was a musician in town and she introduced, she lived at the ranch. And she introduced me, she, we became friends. And she introduced me to a bunch of people who were musicians and, and authors and poets and all kinds of freaks. And they just like hang, hung out there all the time. And um, yeah, I watched them and I played with them and uh, learned from them. How old were they? Mm, they were older than me again. So like they'd be in their 20s, I guess. But you felt accepted. And, and you... I did, yeah. I did, yeah. I do find that I. it's funny. It's like uh, recollecting my, you know, teens and early 20s. People often said I was wise. Like they'd always often perceive me as a wise child. They're like, you're so wise. You're so mature. And now I think people perceive me as an immature adult. So it's like this strange thing happened, this arc, this op opposing arc. Uh, yeah, well, it's not every every teenager that's reading Camus and, and existential authors. It's true. But there are a lot of them. More, I mean, I meet a lot of extraordinary kids and I'm like, what? You have been watching, you know, all of Lars von Trier's oeuvre and you're 18. That's freaking fantastic. I can definitely see, like, it must have made you grow up so quickly because you would have had to be more responsible than I am uh, in my late 20s than at the age of 15. Suddenly you're you're responsible for you. I guess so. I never really thought about it that way. Whereas, whereas now, I mean, it's such an age of prolonged adolescence because we are just, so many of us are supported throughout university. And, you know, we can, a lot of us, uh, there's a whole trend of living at home after university and afterwards. Yeah, I wasn't really great at, at looking after myself. I, I ate a lot of potatoes. I remember at a point it was just like potatoes, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, mashed, fried, and boiled. Um, and I didn't have a lot of money. so. How were you surviving like with, with money? and? Yeah, well, I was, um, you know, I had child support. And, um, yeah, and I had later jobs and stuff like that, like shitty jobs. But I didn't really need much. When you're when you're a kid, you really don't need a lot of food. <laughs> when you're a teenager, you don't, and you can abuse your body. So I don't know. So and then I had friends who fed me. So when you left uh, your dad's place, did you go directly to the uh, ranch? I didn't. Ranch. Never lived in the ranch. I, I lived in a rooming house, not long, like maybe six or seven blocks away. Okay, so there, there was you were able to go right there. There was no uh, intern period where you just were out on your own. Um, there was an interim period, but it was just like at a new school and, you know, being kind of a loner, taking courses, entering contests, you know, just sort of doing that kind of, kind of thing. A lot of solo times. A lot of solo times? What do, what do you mean? Just a loner. And so you eventually started opening up through through art because because then you start getting more involved with music. Well, no, it's just I just I just started making stuff. 
So I took an art class. And, you know, when the teacher was saying, uh, all right, class, I want you to paint this bowl of fruit. I was finger painting exploding heads and um, getting fail marks from the teacher, but enjoying the, this process of making exploding heads. <laughs> and just like finding, you know, doing doing stuff, reading. I had all those books and all that music with me. And then I just started to do my own stuff too. And so did you sort of retreat into into your books and into your art at this time then? I guess so, like most teenagers do. And And so when did you start opening up more and, and becoming more outgoing and confident again? I guess, uh, well, yeah, because I'm in... You're certainly not shy now. No, I am shy, but it's the flip side. So it's like, um, so with this group of, like, with my friends, I formed a band. Not all of them, but there were certain people, and like Peter, who lived down the hall in the rooming house, and James... You know, who were, you know, people that would sometimes hang out at the ranch. And we found each other and started making music and we formed a band. And this is Bob's your uncle? Yes. And it was a, it was a wonderful, crazy carnival. It, it was like I spent a lot of time painting huge backdrops. It was um, very, it was like an art rock band. I had like a bald head painted with eyeballs. Sometimes I'd come out dressed as a building, singing from the point of view of a building, the Blut building, or a cyclops, or a monkey in a cage. It was like total kind of performance art rock weirdness. And it was super fun. And it was like a circus. Um, we made art. We made comic books. It was like this full, full three-dimensional form ex of expression. It was very, very, very fun and experimental. And I was the front person. And so, but I was still really shy, but I could, you know, sing and like express myself in this other way, but come between the songs, I, I wasn't able to talk or off stage, it was really hard for me to talk. Um, but I was with the band um, and that was really wonderful. We toured Canada and it was sort of my weird extended family. They themselves also came from broken homes and unusual situations, but we sort of found camaraderie with one another. Um, and then uh, that band sort of took its course and you know uh, sort of I think every artistic unit has a sort of due date and we were people were going off and doing different things and feeling you know after a while that our band had run its course and it was during that time that there was um, a person in Vancouver who was going to Toronto to to pitch a, 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 te a television show idea to Moses Neimer who was the head of City TV very maverick and open-minded guy and so this guy from Vancouver said that, you know, would I be one of the creators if he got his his um, pitch ap approved? And I said, sure. And I gave him some of my music videos and short films because, as I said, I would enter contests. And one of my very sh first movie was my first official movie was um, The Escapades of the One Particular Mr. Noodle. And that was a contest that I entered through the NFB. They were, you know, looking to fund 10 short films and they ended up getting 500 submissions and mine was one of them that they chose. They chose 10 films to fund. So I never went to school. I never went to art school. I never graduated from high school, but I found life's courses through me this sort of bone and I had to learn how to make a movie that was based on this crazy job I had walking the streets of Vancouver dressed as a 10-foot egg noodle. <laughs> And so yeah, I, I read that, but there was no other context. How, how did that? It was a job. Yeah, it was a job. So yeah, so I was in a. We had a, a gig. We had a show. We were playing a concert at this basement. Above was a pasta bar. In the window was the empty carcass of a ten foot egg noodle, sort of slumped in there, and it immediately piqued my curiosity. I often would do weird things in the city like experiments, experiments where I was sort of the guinea pig in my own experiment. I wanted to be what that, I wanted to be that noodle. And I wondered what it would be like to be that noodle in the world. And so I walked in and I said, who is this? And they're like, it's the Mr. Noodle co costume. We're looking for somebody to be, be that person. I'm like, I'll be that person. And they're like, really? And I took the job. And, and so it was like really terrible pay, but I wanted to see what it was like to be that noodle. So my boss said to me, you know, Mr. Noodle is Motown. And he showed me how to do the walk and I have to do flyers and so forth. So I did that in front of the restaurant. But as soon as I walked away, I just took on this, this personality of this loitering noodle. You couldn't see my face because my face was hidden behind the mesh of the mouth. And he looked kind of like Gumby. He had a beret. He looked a bit like a cross between Gumby and Hitler. 
And um, I um, just wanted to see what it was like to be him. And I said to myself, okay, you cannot say use your voice because as soon as they hear your voice, they're going to associate with your human inside of it. So you can make like onomatopoeic sounds, beep, like that sort of thing. And um, and just saw what ha- would happen. And it, and it was- so You left outside the restaurant vicinity? Yeah, yeah, no, it was, I was just, my job was to walk the streets of Vancouver. Promoting the restaurant. Yeah, yeah. But as soon as I walked away, like the block from the restaurant, then I just loiter and like hang out and make friends and like sit and loiter, you know? So m- many really crazy and wonderful experiences happened during that period of time. Funny, funny, oh, scary. I got, I got beaten up by a gang of skinheads on Gravel Street. And thank God there was enough like foam in the costume, so it didn't hurt. But I was very upset, and I couldn't break out a character. You didn't break out a character. No, I didn't break out a character. But I did go back to the restaurant, take the noodle costume off, and then I, as I was walking up Robson, I saw one of the skinheads hiding behind a bush. And I was like, "I'm a friend of Mr. Noodles, and that was not cool what you did." And he was like, denied it, and then ran and caught a bus to like super fancy neighborhood of town. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I had written all this stuff, like my experiences as Mr. Noodle, just like in my journal. Um, And then... Like ideas for stories or or just your what actually happened to you. Yeah, what happened and just writing down stuff. And then um, somebody said, oh, so Ken, did you hear about this contest the NFB is putting on? They're accepting proposals. I'm putting one in. Um, Can I write you down as doing the music if I get mine okayed? And I said, oh, I wanted to know more about it. And I was like, hmm, thought to myself, I can do this. It's almost a deadline, but I'll lock myself in my room over the weekend and I'll write a script because I know the script. It's Escapades of the One Particular Mr. Noodle. And I wrote it and I put it in a package and I sent it off to the NFB and I covered it with all kinds of crazy stickers to get their attention. And I went down to the West Coast with my girlfriends and we went camping and went on this odyssey and we came back like a month later and I had a message saying that my movie was picked. And I was I bit, did a big, you know... A very happy jump in the air, and and then I realized, holy sheesh, now I have to make a movie, and there's 50 character roles. So it was like kind of trial by fire filmmaking, and to this day, I really love that Mr. Noodle movie. I think it's. Can you see it anywhere? You can see it online. On the NFB's website. No, I just put I posted it on my YouTube, so I own it. Like the NFB, they paid for it, but they don't own the copyright, so I, it's just there. You can see it. Um, but it's, um, still holds true. It still holds, like, I, I oftentimes love to see the first films of filmmakers because there's something, even though they're herky jerky and raw and kind of got a lot of rough edges, you can see certain kind of recurring themes in the work. And there's a theme of like isolation and, and, um, and then also joy and playfulness. And it's just a very playful, weird little anomaly. Try, trying to fit in or, or the, the search, for self, search for place. Elusive. That's that's always elusive. And that's interesting. That even going back to seeing a Woody Allen film or or reading these existential authors. I mean, that's what it's really all. They're all getting at. Yeah, yeah. And Catherine Deneuve in Repulsion. Mm-hmm. These are big questions that everybody has to contend with, because we have like our structured reality, and we have like um, we have what society has said is right and true, and this is what is. But it's really kind of just a construct, and so. You know, you can take away all these different things and what are you left with? You know, who are we? Basic questions. Who are we? Who are we without this? And how easily is it to collapse into this? And if it's so easy to collapse in this, who am I? Like just so many things. It's like endlessly interesting. And that's the basis of religion. You know, I think art to me is kind of religion and search, search, search of what it is, you know, to be alive, to be here. A sort of uncertain religion, I guess. A religion that hasn't figured figured it out the answer yet. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I think at the basis it's a mystery. Really, it's a mystery in all in all world religions. I think when people start to define it and say what is that's the sort of human hand at play, hoping to forge some kind of security. But when you get to the essence of the core of the the ideas, there is a mystery. And I guess it's being comfortable with that that mystery that uh, that gives you comfort. I don't know. It's, it gives me terror too. It's not easy to be without grounding like I'm feeling right now pretty raw because I in my process as an actor I realize that um I have to become the person so I'm right now like 
two days after getting back from Winnipeg and my brain is pretty scrambled. A lot of who I was before, I feel different. You can't like reclaim that same sense of self anymore. No, it's changed. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not the other person. I'm not the fictional person either. So it's a very weird space that I'm in right now. It's sort of a bit ungrounded and at times very terrifying. Yeah. Is there any constant self for you? Yeah, I don't know. That is that does sound quite quite scary when you don't feel like there is a dependable you or that you can say that this is who I am and I know this is a set thing. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It's like um, I you know a lot of people can a lot of actors can go to a place and then get out of it and I noticed it for short bus and for this movie, the Jack Layton story, um, like. I had to age three decades. There is the love story that is at the heart of the piece. And then there is the difficulty and the death of your loved one. Right now, it's, it went, I went to some very dark and difficult places. And they're kind of hard to shake. You know, I feel like I'm carrying them right now. And I feel like I have to sort of hopefully deprogram myself. Yeah, no, some, some people can really just go there and then get out. But I'm not seasoned like that. And I know that I have to, I have to sort of become and authenticate that experience. But that's hard. It's a hard process. So I hope to get my, um, I, I hope to get unscrambled. And so at this point in my sort of confusion of mind and um, self, it's just I'm working just to try to, try to accept that that's where I am, am right now. So yeah, it's a, it's a, a perennial problem or a perennial theme throughout all your art forms. I guess so. So you make this film, and then this somehow gets sent to the people at Much Music. Oh 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 oh! You mean escapades of the one person? Yeah, it was all my reel, you know. And and then what happened was so he was sending a demo that included this. Yeah, yeah. He went to to Toronto to pitch, and he showed some of my my films and music videos and stuff. And Moses was like, I'm not interested in your pitch, but who is this kid? And he phoned me up and he's like, I saw your work. I'm sending a camera, camera operator to your house. You do whatever you want for 10 minutes. To Vancouver. Yeah, to Vancouver. I'm like, who are you? You're challenging me. Okay. And so, you know, I've got a million things that I can do. So I, I had just gotten some girlfriends of mine where um, they were squatting on Reed Island, one of the islands in, in the Gulf where no one lives and there's all these abandoned old houses that were once, you know, miners and for, you know, forestry guys live there. And so, um, I spent a summer there and, and we just ran around in high heels in the woods and like babe clothes and like shotguns and sh shot stuff. <laughs> so I had all these wigs and stuff and I, a, a large squirt gun collection. So I had the sort of these different, um, sort of, um, ideas of, of, of scenes with wigs and guns and characters and then some stuff and I had it all in my head how I wanted to edit it and so I sort of directed the camera operator and told him what I was going to do and did the whole thing and then send it off and you're like in your early 20s at this point or mm -hmm, yeah and so um yeah then uh the, the the camera guy came over we shot it sent it off and um and then like two days later Moses was on the phone offering me a job to work at much music and, you know, I hadn't watched a lot of much music. I was living very acoustic lifestyle, extremely poverty struck, but loving it because I could make my art. And I really, really rejected a lot of like my, my mom, part of her difficulty was she was raised impoverished and she really wanted to be rich. And so this materialism sort of blinded her to the more human relationships. Everything was about money and so forth. And so I really rejected that idea because I could see how much pain it was bringing her. So I really didn't care if I was eating. I, those potatoes were delicious, and it seemed to give me en enough nutrition. I was just happy to be making art and happy to be having friends that I could make stuff with. And so when this happened, I didn't have a TV, and I didn't really know what much music was about, and had a conversation with Moses, and he's like, what, do you have a problem with TV? I said, I don't have a problem with TV. I was a TV addict, but I do find a lot of stuff really boring on that. So it's really what you put on the television. And so I, I, anyway, he, um, he ended up offering me this job. And at that point, the band was sort of on the sort of tail end of our run. And I thought, what the hey, I have never lived outside of my hometown. Now this is my first official job. 
and I went to work at Much Music and you know, that was a crazy thing. Moses was very much a sort of McLuhan-esque um, supporter, encourager of process. So he oftentimes would hire people off the beaten track to be a meteorologist. I think he had one guy who was a taxi driver who knew a lot about the weather. And he asked him to like park his car and come into the studio. And then he hired him as the meteorologist. And then here's this weird Chinese girl doing kind of crazy stuff. And He's like, who is this? Let's put her on. And never scripted. His belief was like, let's see you sink on air. Let's you scramble on air. And the audience, as you grow, will become endeared to you. And they will grow with you. And so they did. And so it was a very fantastic place. And I started to make television there. And, you know, with my background of playwriting and film and making stuff, TV was the last one of the last bastions that I had never expressed myself in. And so I wanted to see, just like I did, you know, walking the streets as a 10-foot egg noodle, to me this offered a great experiment. What can I express and communicate in mass media? And to me that was exciting. To me that was super incredible because there was a lot of stuff that I did that was just like, what? And the immediacy of a single image, asking, you know, a camera to slowly zoom into my armpit. I mean, it sounds juvenile, but it's also very radical <laughs> or, you know, um, I don't know, just there was a lot of hours to fill. And to this day, people come up to me and say, oh my God, that was incredible when you fill in the blank. I'm like, oh my God, I did that. Oh, I forgot. You know, or, you know, there were many hours to fill. So I said, okay, I've got an idea for a TV show. Give me one of those tiny cameras and I'll put it together. And it was this thing called Eyeball Theater, which is very much like DNTO. And um, just me with a camera walking around and seeing who I can meet and who will share their story with me. I, I want to come back to, to actually what it was like to start off at much. I mean, like you say, you were living this very alternative poverty stricken lifestyle and suddenly you land in Toronto, not really knowing, I'm, I'm sure what you're getting yourself into. And you're at the center of the sort of media landscape in Canada. What was that like? Like, do you remember the first day or like entering the much music building for the first time? I do. I was dressed as a fast food waitress. And I had made a huge tower of videotapes stuck on a fast food tray. And I was on roller skates and I wanted to, you know, skate around serving up music, fast food. And um, I remember walking in, it was just like, it was very much a science fiction reality. Me having lived in a very rootsy kind of like no electricity, acoustic style way of being, suddenly being surrounded by the steel eye of a camera everywhere, people on their computers, just like a buzz of stuff. So it was like very strange. Um, and I, it was one of those things where I wanted to see. So I spent a lot of time in the beginning talking to my friends through the TV and saying, hey, Marina, how's it going? How are the cats? And then Marina would like contact me back like through some other means. So it was like, how do we communicate? How can I communicate directly to you? You know, doing weird stuff like that. And so, so it sounds like you were given free reign basically, like to be yeah. who you wanted yeah. to be? It's pretty much, that was the, that was it. Free free reign and many hours to fill. I, this is like every person in their 20s dream, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you're given the spotlight and you get to be on national television and, and interview bands, that uh, iconic bands. I mean... Were you just dumbstruck that this had happened without any sort of plan of of going out and seeking it? No, nope, not really. It just felt natural in, in a way? Yeah. It just found, felt like kind of like an extension of an adventure. And were you shy in front of the camera at first? or? Oh, yeah. So I think that's what you were saying. Like, when did you become extroverted? So I became extroverted when I worked at Mush Music. So it no longer was like flipping a switch like it was before when you were... Um, in the band where it was like, oh, my God, she's running around and her head shaved and she's doing all this crazy stuff. And now she's really shy between songs. And now she's gone back to the dressing room. And now she's, you know, that was sort of a weird polarity there. Whereas when you're when you're when you have to talk and, you know, I can't just be shy on TV. And something happened, I think. Something happened during that time. And I think I, my, one of my best friends, James, who was in the band, he always lit up a room and just said whatever was on his mind. And I really was inspired by his demeanor. And I just started letting my inner James rip and just doing that stuff. And I, I do feel still there is a duality. There is a desire to communicate. There is a desire to, you know, 
to speak and and um, express myself. And I guess you know some people say, "Wow, you're so extroverted and stuff," but I am still. There's the the, the flip side. I think probably so many people who are performers or whatever have that sort of shadow side of like self doubt, shyness, uncertainty. People often kind of say say, "Wow, you're so brave." And I actually don't feel brave. Like, I think I'm just more like stupid. Like sometimes I, like when I was a kid, there was a Santa Claus lunch in a hotel and they're like full of hundreds of kids. And Santa said, who wants to come up and do this thing with me? And in a heartbeat, I just walked up and I, my parents to this day were like, oh yeah, everyone else else was so shy, but you never even thought of that. So it's more out of like complete not realizing how I'm coming off that gives a kind of illusion of bravery. But as soon as I go, oh my God, I'm standing up here with Santa, what did I do? You know, like there's a sort of moment where you're like, oh my God. What? So it's kind of like, you know, I do things because I don't know, like and I just sort of run off and then and then I realize afterwards, whoa, I guess that was kind of, I should be embarrassed by that. You throw yourself over the edge and then you have to find a way to deal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, in the film you acted in, Short Bus, you're completely naked on screen. You have intercourse on screen. It's not everyone that could, even if they try to throw themselves off, you have to be running pretty, pretty full speed at that cliff to to be able to do it. Were you nervous for that, or was that the same sort of duality? Um, I was nervous for that. Um, I had made a movie with John Cameron Mitchell, Hedvig and the Angry Inch, um, and he's a wonderful filmmaker, and I love his stories. He makes movies that hit the heart. And the head and the funny bone and he's a terrific person and I knew I wanted to work with him again and I said to John you know let me know when you're working on a new project and short short bus was the project he was um interested in looking at human relationships through um the lens of how we conduct ourselves sexually with one another so it wasn't a porn that he was making it wasn't about getting off on the sex it was like how you know, the crazy dynamics that occur in the realm of sexuality between people, their desires, their conundrums, their conflicts. So um, it, he didn't have a script, but um, what he did was he set up, he asked everybody to send a video talking about a personal experience about, you know, something to do with their sexual development. And, um, and then he watched them all. He got, he received hundreds of, of videos and then chose like, I think like there was like 50 and then had this crazy New York city based art camp where everybody converged on the, on the city. And we went for dinner and had played all kinds of games, hung out with one another. And he threw us into improvs. There was like a big sheet that you'd had to watch the other videos, see who you were attracted to and tick, tick who you're attracted to. And then sort of, he'd throw you in an, an improv situation together, a non-sexual improv, just to see what your chemistry was like. So through that process, he cast his leads without a script. And for the next two years, we would go down to New York city and through improvisation created our characters. And, um, he would bookmark the most exciting, um, improvs and then he would go away and then he fashioned a screenplay based upon the raw material we were giving him. So it was a very much, um, a long process and, and many of the storylines have to do with confronting of fears. My, my character, a lot of the people, people just assume, oh, you must be so sexually comfortable and whatnot and whatnot. And it's like, no. No, I'm completely confounded sexually. I'm afraid of people. I have a hard time expressing myself in these ways. This is what I'm my my what I'm kind of gonna bring to this. So my character that came came up was like a sex therapist who helps people, couples, and helps them very well, but herself, she is a wreck and she is, you know, she can't relate to her husband so well. She's now like in a caretaking role to her husband. She's never experienced an orgasm. So her own private life is very fraught, but she's trying to keep the semblance of this professional who's like in the know, who can solve everybody else's problems. So it was like a kind of, that was a very difficult person to be for a few years. So yeah. Um, but you're still uncomfortable doing that? Like it wasn't like, that wasn't an easy thing for you no, to it do? Wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing at all. No. Nope. And many of my scenes were fraught with dis ease, like di Ill um, discomfort. But that was part of the character too. That was her story. Uh, is that that seems to be throughout a lot of what you you do, even on DNTO and telling people sort of more vulnerable stories? 
uh, or being goofy on much music or, or whatever. It, it seems to be that common theme of, of sort of exposing your soul and then um, hoping that people connect to it or, or maybe just having a cathartic release through opening up and, and being vulnerable. Would you say that's the case? I don't think it's just a cathartic release for me. It's not just like, yeah, I can go do that. I could, you know, I think it's an important thing. I think people are connected and we don't have means of expressing. And it really requires some people in the world to express those things or else we're operating in isolation. Um, that's, I think, the great thing about art is you portray and express and convey something and somebody in the audience will see and go, oh my God, I get that. I understand that. You know, so there is a kind of hopefully a back and forth, a relationship that happens. And I think it's about, I don't know. Um, I think it's about finding that kind of soul to soul connection that is the same with everyone. Like it's kind of runs, runs through everybody. But I think we're oftentimes afraid to express ourselves and not everybody can. And so it's important for artists to kind of capture whatever it is that you seek to express so that it's useful for other other people to see themselves in it, reject it, or any 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 reaction to it. So art is as a way of breaking down the walls that otherwise stop us from connecting with one another. It's, it's communication. You've said that uh, storytelling for you is sort of a quasi spiritual experience. Or art. Or or art. Art is storytelling is an aspect of what is a big aspect of what I do. But um, no, it's more of the expression. I, I appreciate when people express and I plunk myself down on the streets of Toronto, you know, every week, every Monday, I gather, gather people's perspectives who normally aren't featured on the, in the media. And there is not a day that goes by where I just go, these lives are rich. Wow. You, that happened to you? My God, and and people telling me these things. It's probably stories that they've likely never even shared often. Sometimes they've never been asked because, you know, and we have this thing where, you know, when people are on featured in the media, they're like, ask for their opinion. What do you think about the tax cuts? And so we're like sort of reduced to punditry. We're, we're reduced to an opinion. We're much more than an opinion. And everybody that I run into, if they're willing to talk to me and share the events of their lives, they're amazing. And I feel really, I feel, you know, I feel very lucky to hear those things and be able to share those things with other people. Um, I really love stories. My, my family, my dad's a terrific storyteller. He grew up in very difficult times. And my older sister regaled me with stories as I lay in her bed, I'm purely imaginative stories, fantasy stories. And I really love just hearing people's stuff. So was it after, I mean, so you stay at Much Music from from 95 to 2001, is it? Yes, and so what, why did you leave Much Music? Well, it's sort of like the end of an era. Like like my band, things started to repeat themselves. I wasn't as into the music. Um, you know, I'd see the same bands again. And there was a kind of push toward a certain commercialism. You know, when I started, it started to be less free. And it was like, can you go out and cover the Colgate DJ challenge? I'm like, ah, oh, no. So it didn't feel free and it didn't feel fun. So I was like, no. And I had, I met a guy and uh, really was crazy for him. And he was noticing that I had sort of an ADD attitude. You're going to sort of become your environment. So, you know, the sort of hyper technological place that I was telling you about, you know, it had an effect on me. And that was just like constant movement in my head, constant things and so and that was the actual like medium of television that that was I cosmic so. yeah i think that it has an effect like if you're flipping through and you're bombarded by things constantly you're faster mm -hmm. and so i mean dnto is sort of the polar opposite in, in terms of cadence mm -hmm. and the speed of the the program mm -hmm. definitely it's a bit more but it's still uh, all-encompassing job it's it's a tough job you can't constantly have to have ideas, gen be generating ideas and out making things. So that can be really tough too. But, you know, at the end there, it was like, oh, 9-11 happened. I 
was ADD <laughs> or no, I wasn't ADD. I was, I was never diagnosed as such, but I did feel distracted. Um, I was in love and I wanted to just stop everything. So I quit and traveled, traveled for just over a year. And when I, when I announced that I was leaving much music, um, CBC phoned and wanted me to do that. And I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't work now. I've got to like take some time off. And so I did. And then, you know, what, what was that year like? Just hanging out, hanging out with my guy who was like a cinematographer, traveling around, going to Europe, going to Costa Rica, just like chilling out. And then, and then I didn't have very much money anymore. So I um, went back to the CBC and got the job there. And, and what were you after in this travel? Like, I mean, just a way to decompress after so many crazy years in a row? Yeah, I think so. Just like get back to the basics. And so then you you do uh, go to CBC. Did that that feel like a natural transition at that point to get into radio storytelling? No, it felt like a very strange transition. It was almost like I was like I'm a very visual person, and on much music, all I have to do is one gesture, and it speaks volumes. It's an incredible medium. Whereas with radio, you have just sound, and I understood sound from a musical point of view, but I'd never had to express myself only through my words. And it was tough at the beginning, you know, I found myself writing and going, oh my God, that sounds like your 13 year old existentialist self, you know, and you're not using words that normally people use when they're talking. So I'd have to re-vet my work and take out all the words that I would never use just talking to you. And um, that really honed my ability to write scripts for movies. To talk, to write in a natural way that people would actually talk in. To, to write in the vernacular completely sharpen my skills as a, a writer of screenplays and also working within story it's uh like i've done thousands of interviews but i just still feel like i'm scratching the surface of the mystery of what works in an interview and there's no rules there are no steadfast rules and it's kind of this kind of unknowable thing but there are there, there are aspects of the craft that goes into it, but I just still feel like I'm a rank amateur and a student when it comes to interviews. And, you know, with story, having to like really think about story day in, day out, structure of story, what is compelling, what moves me. Um, it's, it's an endless education on the, on the craft of it. So I feel like every week I kind of reinvestigate that in some way. So is that enjoyable to feel like you still you're learning as you go still? Yeah. Yeah, I think that if I knew it all, it would be pretty pretty boring. And it would be time to leave to to something else. It would be. Like I oftentimes see myself as just a student in life. I'd like to always be like that. I never felt feel like I'm a professional or an expert. I don't have a card. People go, "Do I have your, can I have your card?" and I actually don't have a card. Um yeah, I'm just more comfortable in in the perspective of learning stuff and not knowing stuff. But as, as you mentioned, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a two hour show every, every week. There's a, that's an enormous amount of, of stories to produce and uh, content to create. Um, and before that, you know, at much music, full-time demanding job. And yet if you were to take away those two, two things and look at everything else you've done, that would still look like a really impressive uh, career and diverse and prolific. How do you fit, all these different things in like your screenwriting and and your art exhibits how how are you able to do this with such a demanding regular full-time job in the arts i really don't know i'm not sure like this summer everything exploded it was like okay i'm gonna go to vancouver to see my family see my sis oh i have to do a location scout in mexico city for my uh, film that i've been writing and that was very amazing, but it was a lot of work. And then meanwhile, I was also got the job to, you know, play Olivia Chow in the Jack Layton story and learn Chinese. And it was like too many balls in the air. I really feel kind of like, and then the art show, getting the art show accepted, all of these things sort of converged at once. And I am managing to do them and I think I'm doing them well, um, but it is, I do need uh, decompression time. Like, are you able to slow down? Are you, do you get uncomfortable if you don't have a lot of things going on? I, I feel like I'm a very lazy person by nature. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, 
there have been huge swaths where I'm just lazy. Um, but I, uh, I don't know. I think I just changed time. I, I slow time down and there's something about focus. Like I tend to, I think my more obsessive tendencies manifest themselves in art and I just cover some ground and maybe one day I won't do so much, you know, and just chill out or whatever. So if you're writing like a, a screenplay or something, are you able to really zone in and, and just focus on that for a, a long period of time? Yes. Yeah. It's almost like this puzzle that I must ruminate and kind of try to understand and explore and solve on some level. So it seems like whenever you're doing something, even with the acting or or the writing, you, you really jump in uh, head I, first. I do. I guess so. Yeah. And does the rest of life go on pause? What like how how intensive is it when you're when you're doing a project like that? Are, are you able to keep any any sort of grounded balance, or are you completely into it? No, that becomes life, I guess. But but art is still a comfort for you. Or that like the process of creating. Art is sort of a necessity, and it is a comfort, but it's also a challenge, and it's confounding, and I wrestle with it, and it's um. It reveals itself to me. It's, um, yeah, it's miraculous. Miraculous in what way? And in, in just how it says something about ourselves or our, our existence? Well, just a relationship with it. When you're with yourself and making stuff with others, you know, with your thoughts and imagination. It's incredible. But I would also like some downtime where I can actually sleep. Yeah, it doesn't, sound like, it doesn't sound like you leave much time for that. I would like to do more. Do, do more sleep. Yeah, I'd like to sleep more. So basically, as you just want to keep creating and exploring stories in different ways, and basically, however that whatever opportunities come along, that's that's what will make you uh, happy, or that's the the path you'll follow. That's just what I'll do. And hopefully, keep learning it while you're doing it. Hopefully, yeah. You can also learn from huge mistakes too. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. Beyond that, that's that's that's, and then DNTO. So. And DNTO still feels like it's the the right fit for you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it does keep my um, chops honed on story on a weekly basis. Cool. Well, Sakin so Lee, thanks so much. Hey, thanks. That was a long one. Yeah. I don't I don't envy you having to cut that. Thanks so much. Okay, you're welcome. That was my conversation with the host of CBC Radio's DNTO, artist and storyteller Sakin so Lee. Well, that's all the time we have for broadcasting Canada this week. To find out more about the series, you can check us out online at broadcastingcanada.com. And there you can listen to the other interviews we've done with CBC personalities, ranging from the likes of Bob McDonald, David Suzuki, Sheila Rogers, and Eleanor Wachtel. You can also subscribe to the Broadcasting Canada podcast in iTunes. And if you could give us a rating or write us a review, it would really help us out. If you have any comments about the show, I'd love to hear from you. My email is kevin at thepublicradio.org, or you can connect with us through Twitter or Facebook. Broadcasting Canada is a special series by The Public out of CIUT in Toronto, thanks to CIUT station manager Ken Stauer, as well as Eric Bedlam. And final word as always, so what is it like to be a Canadian broadcaster? This is non-negotiable. I'm a human, and I continue to be a, a human. I don't know quite what that was. See you next time on Broadcasting Canada.